Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce Mohammad Madian. He's from Yahoo, where they don't even record their talks. Um, and um, he, he spent there two years already. Before that, he was a, a postdoc researcher in Microsoft for two years. And um, before that, he was a Microsoft fellow. So here's Mohammed. Thank you. Thanks, Kamal. Good to be back. Uh, so this is, I'm going to talk about externalities in online advertising. And this is uh, based on, this is based on two papers. One uh, joint work with Arpita Ghosh that uh, already appeared in the last dub 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 and the second one is the uh, joint work with David Kempe which was going to appear in the ad auctions workshop soon. So uh, let me start with some uh, introduction although I'm sure that most of the people in the room already know about this. Online advertising is a huge business. It's already 21 billion dollars in 2007 and it's, it's one of the fastest growing segments of the advertising business. Uh, and the standard in this business is that advertisers specify how much they're willing to pay for each impression or click or whatever else that you're selling here. And the publishers decide which ads to show on a page based on the values that the advertisers are submitting and also based on the estimates that they have of uh, various quality measures of the advertisers, like the click-through rate, the probability that the user clicks on their ad, or uh, other measures of quality. Uh, an important implicit assumption in all of the models that are standard in the business is that the value of an ad only depends on the ad that's shown and where it's shown on the page, but not on other factors like other ads that are shown on this page. And uh, obviously, intuitively, this seems wrong. The uh, different advertisers are actually competing for the same thing. They are competing for a user's attention, and user's attention is a limited resource. Therefore, you should expect naturally that uh, the value that an, advert, uh, that an ad receives is a function of other ads that are shown on the same page near to it. So for example, if you increase the number of ads on a page, that is going to decrease the value to each of these advertisers. That's, uh, that's completely intuitive. And not only that, the identity of the ads could also matter. For example, if I show an ad for Toyota next to an ad for Honda, presumably that detracts attention from the ad uh, for Toyota more than if I show an ad for Toyota and an ad for Ford. Just because these two advertisers are essentially targeting Toyota and Honda are targeting the same market, market segment, uh, uh, whereas, for example, Toyota and Ford are probably targeting other market segments. Or another, a better example, for example, if you search for Harry Potter, the ads that are shown, probably an ad for a Harry Potter movie is, uh, uh, detracts from attention uh, to an ad for a Harry Potter book less so than two ads for Harry Potter book, for example. Okay, so basically this, is, this becomes a problem that's called, uh, in economic literature, this is called externalities. Uh, an, effect that, uh, an effect that one agent can have on other agents by just receiving an allocation. And the problem becomes essentially a problem of mechanism design with externalities that has been considered in economic literature in different contexts. So uh, let me just mention a few uh, related work in the economic literature and the last one in the CS literature. Uh, these are generally for uh, designing auctions when there are externalities. It's not entirely relevant to what I'm going to talk about, which is mostly modeling the externalities in the context of online advertising. The last one is much more relevant. It's, uh, there are a couple of papers that I'm going to uh, refer to later in the talk. That's about the effect of uh, different links that you have on the page and the, the click-through rate of each link. Uh, the first one is the eye-tracking experiment uh, by a bunch of people at Cornell, and the second one is a click-log uh, evaluation by people at MSR, actually. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to um, go over two models that we propose for externalities in online advertising. Uh, the first model is based on a rational choice model for the viewers, for the users of the search engine or whatever uh, publisher of the advertisements. And in, for this problem, for this model, we are going to focus on a lead generation advertising, which I'm going to define uh, in a couple of slides. And the second model I'm going to talk about is based on a probabilistic model for viewer behavior. 
And for each of these, essentially, what we are going to do is that we are going to assume a model for how users behave, and then based on that, we derive how uh, placing one ad on the page or sending one ad to, to a user is going to affect other ads that, are, that the same user receives. So for each of these models that I'm going to define, uh, we will discuss the computational complexity of the winner determination problem. Basically, assuming that uh, the click-through rates or the values are going to follow a model like this, how should we decide which ads to show on the same page? And uh, following that, uh, there is a brief discussion of incentive compatible mechanism design. OK, so uh, let me start by talking about the lead generation advertising, which is uh, a segment of the online advertising business. I'm sure you've seen it uh, if you've ever tried to buy car insurance or mortgage or even buying a car. You go to, a, uh, there are a number of websites that you can go to, you enter your information, and they contact a number of mortgage companies, for example, or car insurance companies, and each of those companies will contact you directly with codes for car insurance or for whatever else uh, that they're providing. This is uh, mostly used by uh, uh, segments of the market like mortgage firms, insurance companies, auto dealers, uh, distance edu uh, education industry like Phoenix, uh, Phoenix University and so on. Uh, so basically a lead is, is information, is credible information provided by a user and the lead generation companies collect all these leads and sell them uh, to advertisers. Uh, and advertisers directly contact potential customers. Uh, but now there is the, uh, by the way, this is a huge segment of the market. This, uh, in 2006, that was the latest uh, year I could find data for, this was $1.3 billion, and it was like about 8% of online advertising revenue in total. Uh, there is an obvious trade off here. For example, if, you, uh, uh, if your information is sent to 10 mortgage companies, each of those mortgage companies have a lower chance of getting your business. There is an obvious trade-off here. And uh, this is something that, in reality, people have to deal with. Like, uh, I've talked to people who are trying to design a lead generation business, and this is a very real question. Uh, to how many people, to how many advertisers should they send these leads? Okay, so uh, here's an abstract model for this problem. Uh, let's say we have n bidders. Each bidder is an advertiser. And, but the value that the bidder has, the value function that the bidder has, depends on the, other, uh, the set of all the advertisers that are winning in this auction. So it's a function from the set of all subsets of 1 through n to uh, non-negative real numbers. Uh, and vi of s is the value of i, assuming that the set of winners is s. Now, we want to design incentive-compatible mechanism that, uh, that maximize advertiser welfare, which is basically the sum of the values that the advertisers receive. And uh, the classical results in economic literature is the victory clark Groves mechanism show that if you can actually find a set that maximizes this function, then there are simple payment schemes that uh, can induce uh, incentive compatible recording of, uh, reporting of values. So this is the abstract model at a very high level. Let me get into the specifics of the first model I want to define for uh, externalities. Assume we have an advertiser's numbers 1 through n. Now, uh, a user type, here a user is the audience of the advertising, specifies the preference that this user has over advertisers 1 through n, as well as some outside options. Okay, so like, for example, if you're buying a car, you've probably already walked into a dealership, you have some price codes from them, but also you're researching online, uh, you're going to receive some codes, and you're going to compare all those codes as well as the outside option that you have. I'm going to denote the outside option by zero. Now, uh, we have a prior on users types, uh, the, the distribution of how uh, their preferences go. And uh, advertiser i receives a value of vi, which is a fixed number, if, it's, uh, if this advertiser is chosen by the user. Okay, which means that if this advertiser has the highest preference for the user among all the advertisements that this user sees. Uh, now, given this, the, uh, the value of vi of s can be defined this way. vi of s is this number vi times the probability that i is preferred to everything in s union 0, the outside option. And the probability is over the choice of the user, the random type of user. Okay? And notice that uh, in this model, the value of a set, the sum of the values to the advertisers, is not necessarily a monotone function. So, 
it's not necessarily best for you to send the advertisement to as, as many advertisers as possible. And this is, this is intuitive, and the reason here is that if you have an advertiser that a lot of the users actually prefer, but has a very low value, adding this advertiser to your set is going to decrease the overall value of the set. And uh, notice that here by the value, I mean the value to the advertisers. If you want to take the value to the users into account, that would be a whole different story. Okay, so now in order to look at the computational complexity of this problem, I have to define the input representation because here uh, I'm assuming that I'm given a distribution on, over users' types, which is in general, it's, uh, it's a few, um, uh, it can't be given concisely. Yes? Don't you have any assumption that you're a monopolist? Because if you're the only search engine in town, you can wipe out, the, let's say, Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. Because they don't pay you anything for the ad. But if the, uh, the guy across town uh, does, does show it and, pe and people like it, you will lose business. As an advertiser. Oh, oh you're, you're talking about the user side. So on the advertiser side, I'm trying to uh, basically modeling, uh, I'm trying to model existence of other options by having this outside option here. Right? So basically, uh, if you're a user, you've searched other search engines, uh, you, you might have physically walked into, uh, walked into uh, like basically retail stores and have gotten codes, and you have some outside option based on all of those things. This is denoted here. This is already included in the preferences of the user. Right? So in some sense, you don't want to, uh, you want to keep the users happy to some extent as well, as, as much as the outside option forces you to. Basically. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's good. Feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, when Jennifer and Christian were here, I could be sure that uh, I would be interrupted. Uh, but <laughs> no, thanks to Gideon. Uh, okay, so now I need to talk about the input representation. We need to represent the distribution of user pre uh, users' preferences on the advertisers, and the simplest model I can. Uh, we could think of is the explicit representation. Assume that there are m, a fixed number of types of users, a small number of types of users, and uh, a user is of type i with probability pi, so pi's are going to add up to one, and the preferences of users of type i is given by permutation over a set of all advertisers, actually I should say all advertisers union zero. So you have a permutation over a set of zero, one, all the way to n, uh, probability for each type, and that's it. So now for this explicit representation, there is the winner determination problem becomes essentially like this, that we are given n non-negative values, v1 through vn. Okay? These are the values to the advertisers if they receive the business from the user. We have a number k, which is basically a bound on how many advertisers can possibly receive the lead. And we have m permutations, pi1 through pi, pi m of 0 through n. These are, each permutation depend, uh, corresponds to one type of user. And a probability pj is also associated with each permutation. And the question is to find a set S of cardinality at most k that maximizes this function. And this function basically, well, what it says is the same expression that we had in the previous slide. We are summing over all types of users, the probability of the user times the sum, sum over all uh, advertisers that are in the winning set, S. Uh, the value of the advertiser times an indicator variable which, then, which is one if and only if this advertiser is preferred to all the other advertisers and the outside option by this particular user type. Okay. So this is an optimization problem. Uh, the question is whether we can solve this optimization problem efficiently. So, <coughs> uh, the, well the first result which is actually not hard to see is that the winner determination problem is NP hard. And the proof is actually pretty simple. The idea is that uh, when all the values, even if all the values are equal, okay, still the problem is essentially a weighted version of the maximum k coverage. And if you don't know what the maximum k uh, coverage problem is, it's, it's basically you're given a, uh, a number of sets, and you want to select k of these sets to maximize the size of their union. Okay? So you basically want to minimize their overlap and maximize the size of their union. So why is this problem a special case of the maximum k coverage? Uh, or sorry, why is maximum k coverage a special case of this problem? If all the values are the same, the only thing that you care about is how much of the users you are actually capturing. Right? The values are all the same. Right? 
so now advertiser J is going to correspond to a set of users, user types I, that rank J above all the above, above the outside option. Okay, so these are the only user types that if advertiser J is shown, is are going to go with this advertiser or at least with some advertiser. Now uh, the problem becomes to find a set of at most k advertisers to maximize the weight of the set of covered user types, which is exactly the objective function in the maximum k coverage. And the maximum k coverage problem is NT hard, so that means that this problem is also computationally hard. But on the positive side, maximum k coverage problem, there is a simple intuitive greedy algorithm that achieves a constant factor approximation, uh, approximation for that problem. And it also it works very well in practice. So, uh, for a while, our hope was that maybe we can do the same for this problem. Maybe there is a simple greedy algorithm that solves this problem with a constant approximation factor. And we actually spent a lot of time on this, but uh, eventually we came up with the hardness of approximation proof, which is actually pretty strong. Uh, we can show that the winner determination problem is even hard to approximate within any factor better than n to the minus, uh, one, uh, 1 minus epsilon, which is pretty uh, strong negative result. And the proof is based on a reduction to the independent set problem. I'm, I'm going to talk about the proof too, just because it gives uh, some intuition of what type of hard instances are there. So uh, in retrospect, this is actually a pretty simple uh, reduction. We are given a graph G that has X vertices. Okay? And the problem is to find the maximum independent set in this graph. And if you don't know what that means, it's a set of vertices that uh, there is no edge between them. Okay, and this problem is NP hard, it's very hard to approximate. Now, uh, given this graph, I want to construct an instance of this uh, winner determination problem that is essentially as hard as solving the maximum independent set problem in the graph. So if I have x vertices in the graph, I'm going to set the number of user types and also the number of advertisers to x. And also I'm going to set k to x. So k was the uh, upper bound on the number of advertisers that could win. So basically, that means that there is no upper bound on the number of advertisers that can win. So each vertex corresponds to one advertiser and also corresponds to one user type. Now, corresponding to node i, the advertiser that's defined corresponding to node i, I'm going to give it a value of l to the power i, where l is a really large number. Okay, so the values of different uh, advertisers are going to be very, very different. And also, Oh, notice that here I'm essentially I'm, I'm numbering the nodes from 1 through n. Okay, so uh, node 1, the value of the corresponding advertiser is L to, the, uh, L to power 1, node 2, L squared, and so on and so forth. Also, I'm going to define uh, this set ni. This is the set of neighbors of i in the graph that have index less than i. Okay? And the permutation pi i is defined this way. I'm going to rank all the elements of Ni before I. It doesn't matter in which order I'm ranking these elements of Ni. But everything in Ni comes before I. And then I put I. And then I put the outside option. And then after the outside option, it doesn't really matter. I can put anything. And the probability of this permutation, also I set the probability of this permutation to some constant C divided, to, uh, divided by L to the I. Okay? And the constant c is set so that the sum of all the probabilities are equal to 1. It, it's not going to matter. So now, let, let's see what's happening here. So I have n user types and I have n advertisers. The value of the i advertiser is l to the i. And the probability of the i user type is c divided by l to the i. And notice that the preference of the i user essentially, uh, the only things that you, uh, this user has before the outside option are i and also neighbors of i that, are, that have index less than i. Okay? So the value that this user is going to get, the expected value that this user type is going to get if uh, she is assigned to advertiser i is going to be c divided by l to the i times l to the i, which is c, a constant. But if she is assigned to any advertiser in n i in this set, then the value is going to be c divided by l to the i times something that's much, much smaller than l to the i. It's like l to the j for some j less than i. So the value, if, if it happens that this, advertise, if this user is assigned to an advertiser in an i, the value is going to be much, much lower than if she is assigned to i. So basically, the total value that we get, the only dominant terms are going to be the ones that correspond to 
user types that are assigned to the same advertiser, and essentially the advertiser with the same index. And as a result, uh, we can prove this result basically. The point is that if you have two advertisers, two winning advertisers in your set that are connected by an edge in the graph, then at least one of those advertisers are not going to be, uh, be able to derive this high value. Okay? And as a result, we get that the value of the optimal set is going to be something between C times the size of the maximum independent set in the graph and the same value plus some small number. So what this shows is that the problem is essentially as hard as uh, the problem of solving the maximum independent set in the graph, which uh, we all know is a pretty difficult problem. So, uh, but on the positive side, uh, notice that this reduction uses instances where the advertiser's values have a large span. Okay, so you have values that you have advertisers that have a very very low value for this uh, lead, and other other advertisers that have a very high value which is not exactly a realistic situation. So actually that's, that's a nice thing about uh, looking at the computational complexity of the problem and looking at the reduction because it gives you a feeling of what's the, uh, what are the hard instances and then you can try to modify your approach, try to target instances that are not ruled out by those reductions. So basically here the question would be uh, if we have a bound on the maximum value divided by the minimum value, can we get something better here? Can we, can we have an algorithm that has a better factor? There is a simple uh, R times E over E minus 1 algorithm by just completely ignoring the values, assuming that all the values are the same, and then running the maximum K coverage greedy algorithm. That's going to give us this. Basically, we're losing a factor of R because, because we're ignoring the values and another factor of E over E minus 1 because of the greedy maximum K coverage algorithm. But can we do better than this? And in fact, we can. There is a standard technique that we can apply here. Uh, we can divide advertisers into log R buckets. Each bucket will uh, co uh, correspond to advertisers that have a value in some interval, in some exponentially increasing interval. So here, I've, I've set the j uh, interval here. Uh, yeah, I've set the i interval as uh, the set of all advertisers that have value between e to the i minus 1, where e is the base of the natural logarithm, times v mean, and e to the i times v mean. Now, given this bucketing of the advertisers, notice that in each bucket the value of the advertiser are only off by a factor of e at most. And now, if you look at the optimal solution of the problem, this optimal solution is driving some of the value from each of these buckets. Okay? So since there are log r different buckets, there must be at least one of these buckets that gives, that in the optimal solution, gives at least the 1 over log r fraction of the revenue. So that means that if I actually, if I even pick a random bucket and solve the maximum k coverage for this, uh, for this bucket, I'm going to get the factor that's at most log r plus 1 times e squared over e minus 1. Here, log r plus 1 comes from the fact that I'm only looking at one bucket instead of all of the buckets. There is a factor E that comes from the fact that I'm ignoring the values within each bucket, and the values could be off by factor E. And there is another E over E minus 1 that's coming from the greedy maximum k coverage algorithm. So here's one positive result, that there is an approximation algorithm with a factor equal to this number. And in fact, it's very easy to de-randomize this algorithm. Basically, instead of picking a random bucket, you can just pick the bucket that has the maximum value. And in fact, this algorithm, so now if you want to turn this algorithm, this is an approximation algorithm. So if you want to use the VC te VCG technology, the Vichy Clark Groves payment scheme, to turn this into an incentive compatible mechanism, one classical result says that uh, this is only possible if the allocation rule is monotone. What that means is that if I'm an advertiser, if I increase my value, the algorithm should not drop me from the set of winners. Okay? It should not be the case that increasing one's value decreases the likelihood that this person will be one of the winners. So this algorithm, as I stated, it is not monotone because when you increase your value, you might fall into a different bucket and the competition might be tougher in that bucket. But in fact, there are, uh, it's uh, relatively straightforward. It's not difficult to actually turn this algorithm into a monotone algorithm by making these buckets essentially overlapping. And uh, therefore, we get the monotone allocation rule and Using this and the VCG payment rule, we can get an incentive compatible deterministic mechanism that approximates social welfare within a factor of order log V max divided by V mean. 
And uh, one nice thing is that the algorithm is actually, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, when you look at the algorithm, it's actually pretty simple and intuitive. Basically, what it's doing is that it's uh, taking one threshold for the value and only looking at the advertisers that fall above this threshold. And for those advertisers, it essentially solves the problem using a maximum k-coverage greedy algorithm. Uh, and the threshold is chosen in a, in a way that maximizes the revenue. Okay, so, uh, so that's one positive result. Uh, there are a couple of other positive results that I'm just going to mention. Uh, for other special cases of the preferences, we can also get uh, exact algorithm, exact efficient algorithm. Uh, again, the point is that if you look at the reduction, you see that the preferences that we're giving the users are very different. From one user to, the, uh, to another user, the preferences are very, very different. Uh, if the preferences are correlated in some sense, then, this, the, then the, uh, we have a better picture. For example, if the preferences are single peaks, I'm not going to define this, but essentially it means that, uh, so like for example, in the, uh, if there is a spectrum of everything from right to left and each user has an ideal point and essentially ranks things based on the distance between himself, uh, between his ideal point and the, and the object, uh, then in this case we can actually get an exact algorithm for the optimization problem. And also if uh, all the preferences are some notion of perturbations of a single ranking, then we can get an exact algorithm. Both of the algorithms use dynamic programming. There are a lot of details there, but uh, there is nothing fundamentally difficult. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to say about the first model. I'm going to get back to this at the end and have some discussion. Yes. That's a very good question. Yes, I am assuming that. Uh, the reason we are assuming that is basically that the user type, you can't necessarily observe the user type here. Right? So we are assuming that there are these user types, but when a user comes to your search engine, you don't necessarily know what user type this is. But uh, obviously, you might be able to use extra information, like targeting information, in order to deduce things about the user type. And uh, th that's a very good question, actually. But uh, Basically, this assumption is not, uh, it's not losing much generality because if you actually have extra information that you could target things better, you can basically essentially separate these markets. Like uh, if uh, based on additional information, you can guess whether this user is looking for Harry Potter the book or Harry Potter the movie, you can basically assume that you have two different markets here and solve the optimization problem independently for each of these markets. And presumably, your set of winners should be different if you actually have some extra information here. Okay, that's that's uh, what targeting means, really. Say it again. So the reason the problem is difficult is because for the same set of observable user type, uh, I assume that they are inherent in different user classes which have different permutations of references. Okay. So I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure I'm, under, uh, I'm understanding the question here. Basically, uh, if you have some extra information that helps you classify the users, if you can basically if you can tell uh, user one from user two then you can have a separate market for user one and a separate market for user two. And for each of those, you can do the optimization for a set independently. If all the users have the same uh, preference permutation, mm -hmm. uh, is the problem trivial in that case? All the users have the same preference permutation, but the values are different. That's, uh, that's your question, right? The values of the advertiser for different user types are different. If they all have the same user type, uh, then sure. I mean, basically, you can assume that the advertisers have the average value for these guys, and you can just merge them into one if you can't observe them. Right? Yes. The model of very large changes in value, a very large change in probability, 
Okay, not all that unreal, unrealistic. You may not want to optimize it, but the Nigerian scams correspond pretty closely to that, to that model. Uh, what was that? What was the Nigerian it? scams correspond pretty closely to the model of you know, very low probability, very high gain for the crook. Uh, <laughs> for some, some users. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your comment. <laughs> Actually, but uh, so that was a good question. Maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Uh, I think there might be some interesting problem there, whether we can actually use, even if uh, user types are unobservable, is there a way to take advantage of differences in permutations in order to target more profitable user types? That's, that's a good question. Yes? When you make uh, um, the algorithm incentive compatible or monotone, do you keep the fact that it's, um, the goal is to approximate the, uh, the benefit of the, uh, of the uh, search engine? You mean the revenue? Yeah. No, so these, uh, the algorithms that are based on VCG, the mechanisms that are based on VCG, obviously they're all trying to maximize the social welfare, which is the sum of the values to the advertisers and to the search engine. Uh, if you want to optimize for the revenue, the general, the, I mean this is not a theoretical result, but the, uh, like basically the general uh, approach is to use a mechanism like this, but set the right reserve prices for different items. Okay. And, uh, that usually gets you close to the maximum revenue. The difficulty in theoretically analyzing and designing an algorithm like that is that you usually need to make assumptions about the uh, distributions of the user types or at least do some sort of sampling to deduce things about the distribution <coughs> of the user types yourself, which makes the result not as clean and probably not as directly applicable uh, to practice. Yeah. Um, my question is the opposite. Um, the advertiser value and the user value can be disjoint mm -hmm. and independent of each other. Is that really the case? Because if a user is looking for something, I would think intuitively that whichever advertiser is deriving the least value from that thing is probably the best choice for the user. Right. So okay, so that, uh, that's also another good question. Basically, we are taking part of the uh, taking the user values and advertiser values as exogenously given. But basically your question is maybe this is endogenous, maybe, this, maybe these things are also determined in the game. I have not looked at that. That's, that, that is a good question. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the second part of the talk, which is the other type of model for uh, externalities. So uh, this part is basically we're looking at a probabilistic model for uh, user behavior and we're, de we're uh, defining a uh, model for externalities based on this probabilistic model. And um, our focus is going to be on sponsored search ads. And the uh, main characteristic of the sponsored search ads in comparison with the previous uh, part, the lead generation, is that the sponsored search ads are listed in a column. Like for example, this is a Google search result, you see that all the advertisements are on the site and they're listed in some order. And presumably the higher advertisements have higher value for the uh, advertisers than the lower ones. Uh, so, but we're, we're going to look at the prob a probabilistic model for how users view and click on these ads based on that's uh, motivated by click log analysis and eye tracking experiments in uh, a couple of papers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, th this model was proposed by Craswell, Zoter, Taylor, and Ramsey from MSR for organic search results earlier. In the, in the last Wisdom conference. And they actually did a click log analysis that uh, confirms that this model is a better model for uh, estimating the click through rate than the separable model that I'm going to define in the next, next slide. And also independently in the context of uh, ad auctions, that, that this is defined for a bunch of, by a bunch of people at Google. Uh, and it's going to, they also have written a paper which has some overlap with ours that's going to appear in the same conference. Okay, so uh, let me define precisely what's going on in sponsor search advertising. For each search, the system shows K, typically K is something around 10, 8, 10, 12. Uh, they show K ads in a sorted order, and the click-through rate of an ad is the probability that this ad is, will be clicked on, and the way it's estimated, it's usually using uh, this assumption that's known as separability. The separability assumption says that the click-through rate of an ad i that's placed in position j, so positions are 1 through k, 
it's the product of two terms. One term only depends on i, okay? So let's call it alpha i. And the other term only depends on j. Let's call it lambda j. Okay? So uh, an interpretation of this assumption is that a user, when, it, when this user is looking at the advertisements, the user views the position j with probability lambda j. So this is the probability that this user even sees this position. And then assuming that this user sees this position, she is going to click on the ad in this position with a probability that depends on the quality of this ad. Okay? Let's, let's call it alpha a. So this is a standard assumption. And as far as I know, all of the uh, auction uh, engines for sponsored search are basically built based on this assumption. And the click-through rate learning, everything is based on this assumption. Now, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a model that's essentially that's an alternative proposal. Uh, we are assuming that each ad has, is specified by, by three parameters. One parameter is the value, which is what we had before. This is the value that the advertiser receives if there is a click on their ad. And, uh, and notice that I've switched from value per lead that we had in the previous part of the talk to value per click. Now I'm assuming that we have some fixed value per click, which is not enti an entirely uh, accurate assumption, but I'm going to go with this assumption for now. So there is also another parameter, which is a probability QI, that if a user views the ad, she will click on it. Okay? And finally, there is a probability CI, that if a user views an ad, she will continue viewing the next ad as well. Okay? So now, this additional parameter CI allows us for situations where, like, when you see an ad, and it's really a good ad, that's that uh, already satisfies your uh, purpose, you're going to click on it and you're not going to look at the other ads afterwards. And it can also model situations that are completely opposite. Like you see an ad which is so crappy that you're just, you just give up looking at the ads and you don't look at the ads afterwards. So now <coughs> we assume that the user starts from the top position, the first position. She looks at this first ad with probability one. That's just a matter of scaling. It's not really an assumption. And uh, then with probability C1, where 1 is the index of the advertisements in that spot, is going to, she's going to look at the second ad, and so on and so forth. So given this model for advertiser behavior, feel free to interrupt me if there is anything. Does she yeah. look at the next ad independent of whether or not she clicks? Uh, very good question. I'm assuming that I mean, uh, these probabilities are independent of the previous ones. But this is an uh, assumption without loss of generality, because essentially I'm looking at the aggregate uh, probability. So this probability is. Uh, in the for the purpose of the optimization, uh, for other contexts it might be different actually, but for the purpose of the optimization, uh, I only care about the aggregate probability. Right? Since when I'm, when I'm deciding which ads to put, I don't have the information whether this guy is going to click on an ad or not. So I can't make decisions based on that. And as a result, it's enough to have the aggregate probability of continuing. But that's a very good question. Uh, most likely the probability is not independent of whether you're clicking or not. Yeah. Should CI be always less than 1 minus QI? So there's some dependence in the case. Uh, so you, should CI be always less than 1 minus QI? Because if you are clicking on an ad, you presumably are not going to click on future ads. So I'm not going to make that assumption. That's, that sounds reasonable. But I'm not going to make that assumption. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't need that assumption, basically. But, but in general, the assumption doesn't need to be such that if the user really wants to buy something, they will click on the first thing and right. see if they don't like it, they go back. Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. The, statistically, probably it happens in a small portion of the, uh, small fraction of the users do this. But presumably, maybe there's a large uh, benefit in looking at those small fractions. So I, I'm not going to make an assumption like this, basically. Yes? Strongly de dependent on, on browser design. Like if one, if you can get one click, click less to open in a new tab, you get more multiple ad open. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm sure this def uh, these things depend a lot on the user interface design. Uh, but basically, here I'm focusing on a part of it that's really a function of this particular ad that I'm placing there. I want to see what's the effect of this particular ad that I'm placing. Okay. And uh, actually, just to clarify the. Uh, connection with the previous work with the paper by Craswell et al. in the context of uh, organic search results. Their model, first of all, they don't have the values just because it's for organic search results. There's, there are no bits. You just want to maximize the click-through rates. 
And they also assume that QI is actually precisely equal to CI. Okay, so the rest, what is it? Oh yeah, yeah one minus, one minus CI, that's correct. Uh, so basically what they're assuming is that uh, you're clicking on an ad with probability equal to QI, and pro uh, if you don't click on an ad, on this ad, you're going to go to the next ad. Okay, so that's the assumption that they're making, which seems a little bit restrictive, but the interesting thing is that even with this assumption, they're showing that, uh, based on the click logs, this is a better fit to the click log data than the separable click through it model, which is pretty surprising actually. Okay, so now uh, given this model, formally if ads one through k are displayed in this order, the probability that ad i is clicked on is going to be the product of c1 through ci minus one times qi, and therefore the winner determination problem becomes to find an ordering of the uh, of k adds, of at most k adds, that maximizes this function. v1 times q1 plus v2 times c1 q2 plus, and so on and so forth. Basically, the product of this term and vi summed over all i. Now, here, as it turns out, actually the problem is much easier from a computational complexity perspective. Uh, there is a lemma that shows that if there is no limit on the number of add slots that are shown, the optimal ordering is to sort all the ads in decreasing order of vi times qi divided by gamma minus ci. Okay, so uh, this is a parameter that the ads needs to be, not need to be showed, uh, sorted based on. So you can think of this essentially as the value of the advertiser times some squashed version of the click-through rate of the advertiser. Okay? And that's the optimal ordering if you don't have any limit on the number of ads that you can show on the side of the page. Obviously, you do have a limit on the number of ads that you can show on the side of the page, uh, but still the problem can be solved. Uh, or the proof of this lemma, I'm not going to prove it, but it's based on a simple exchange argument. If you've seen proofs of uh, a sc a greedy scheduling algorithms being optimal, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you assume that you have the optimal ordering, and you show that if this ordering is violated among two, ex uh, two consecutive elements by switching them, you're going to increase the value. So it's pretty simple. Uh, so if you do have a limit on the number of ad slots that you can show, uh, obviously this, uh, the optimal ordering might be somewhat different from this because, for example, for the last ad that you're showing, the last slot, there's nothing after this. So you don't really care about the continuation probability. Uh, but as it turns out, we can still solve the problem optimally because uh, we can show that still, if you select the set of ads that are shown in the page, these ads should be sorted based on this order. Okay. So now the problem becomes only to select the set of ads that you show on this page. And this can be done using uh, basically a dynamic programming approach. Given this lemma, you can do it with a dynamic programming approach. Okay, so <laughs> that's it. That's pretty much a complete picture for uh, this model that I defined. There are a number of generalizations of the model. Uh, first of all, you could have position-dependent multipliers. So in this model, I, I was assuming that the probability that you go from at i to add i plus one, if you, that you view at i plus one, assuming that you already view it at i, is a, a term that's only depending on the advertiser that's displayed in, ad, uh, in slot i. But uh, in general, you could assume that uh, this probability is not only dependent on the ad, but also on things that are dependent on the slot itself. Okay? So to some extent, this addresses uh, Gideon's question that uh, you have there could be things that are dependent on, on the slot. Based on the interface design, for example, if something falls off the page, then the probability of going to that ad is significantly lower, no matter what ad is shown at the end. Uh, so for this model, assuming that we have this position-dependent multiplier as well, there is a simple four approximation algorithm that we can give. And it's, it's, the algorithm is simple and intuitive, and uh, it seems, seems applicable in practice. Uh, theoretically, we can also get a quasi-polynomial time approximation scheme. So basically, for any factor that you want, we can approximate the problem within that factor uh, within time that's not quite polynomial, but uh, sort of like k to the power log k. So, yes? Uh, results, similar results when the two problems also depend on the slot. I haven't thought about that. Some of the techniques might apply there, but I have not thought about that. Um, 
All right, so, but from practical per, uh, perspective, the polynomial time approximation scheme is a bit too slow to be applicable practically. And also, uh, theoretically, another interesting question is that we don't have an empty hardness proof in this case. We've actually tried to prove empty hardness, but we haven't been able to. So it's not entirely clear what's the, uh, what's the picture theoretically for this problem. Another uh, generalization of this is when you have multiple ad slates. For example, if usually for a ser sponsored search, you have a top uh, slate for ads and you have a, a east slate for ads. And uh, in this case, you might assume that the, advertise that the users behave slightly differently. So they don't necessarily jump from the bottom uh, ad on the, on the north to the top ad on the east. They might be looking at different ad slates with different probabilities. There is a generalization for this case, and in fact, we can approximate the problem pretty well uh, if the number of different ad slates is constant, which is pretty realistic. Okay. Usually, the number of different ad slates at most two or three. OK, so uh, that's it. Uh, I'm just going to conclude by discussing a number of interesting uh, open directions. Uh, first of all, our contribution was to define models for externalities in online advertising uh, based on assumptions about how users behave. And we discussed the computational hardness of the winner determination problem, which is a fundamental problem, assuming that you, uh, that you have a model for uh, uh, externalities. Now, there are, uh, this is a very interesting field. This is uh, pretty new. People have not really looked at the externalities uh, by much. And this is something that there is a lot of uh, potential in it because the, the business is huge. It's, as I said, in 2007, there was uh, $21 billion spent on online advertising, which is a huge number. Uh, and uh, the whole business is basically based on this assumption that uh, the, uh, the click-through rates are separable. And this is obviously wrong. There is a lot that could be gained here. There are heuristic approaches that uh, seem to have helped. Like, for example, if you look at the data, for ex uh, Google shows fewer ads than both Microsoft and Yahoo, uh, whereas the revenue for search is considerably higher than micro both Microsoft and Yahoo. And that's, uh, that's puzzling. Uh, and one justification for that is that there is better targeting there. There is a, 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 this fact, even though it's not explicitly taken into account in estimating the click-through rate, still they take into account that showing more ads doesn't necessarily increase your total revenue. Uh, so now here, uh, uh, on the theoretical front, we are still at the beginning. We still need to define the models that are both interesting uh, from a practical point of view and also make sense theoretically. Uh, first of all, there is a question of experimental evaluation of these models. The only result that I know, the only published result that I know on this is the uh, work by Craswell et al. in the context of online uh, un organic search results. And obviously, there is much more to be done here. Um, now, th there is also the question of whether we can come up with more general Markovian model for user behavior. So basically, the model that we were talking about was uh, assuming that some sort of the users are following some sort of Markov chain where the parameters of this Markov chain are coming from the advertisements that are placed in different spots. And uh, an interesting question, theoretical question, is whether we can generalize this. And presumably, users are not just in two states of clicking or not clicking, viewing or not viewing. Uh, uh, if we can come up with something more complicated, that might be a more uh, realistic uh, uh, model for how users behave. And uh, there's also the question of these models that I've talked about, and uh, there were basically two models. One assuming that the, mo the users are acting perfectly rationally. So they see a set of advertisements. They select the one that's maximizing their utility among these. The other one assu was assuming that the users are basically just Markov chains. To just uh, transition with given probabilities. And there is a third class of uh, algorithms. There is a paper by uh, Susan Athey and Glenn Ellison that's uh, looking essentially at something like this. So there is also an element of signaling here. If you're showing an ad at the, on the top, you're signaling to the user that the value equality of this ad is higher than the other ones. Okay? So that by itself could increase the probability of the, uh, this ad being clicked on, independent of the position and also independent of the ad identity. So it would be interesting to look at combinations of these models, because the reality is probably somewhere in between. Uh, users don't look at all the ads and select the best ones. Users do care about which ads they perceive as better than others. And also users do look at the, uh, uh, basically the confidence vote that you're giving to the different advertisements by placing them higher or lower. So 
So that would be a very interesting theoretical uh, direction as well as experimental direction. There is the question of learning externality. So one problem with all of these models is that uh, the more complicated you, your model gets, uh, the harder it becomes to learn the parameters of the model and uh, basically do anything practical uh, based on that. So we have to be careful not to get the models too complicated. And there is the question of learning these parameters of this model. For example, one very specific theoretical question is for the cascade model, is there any algorithms similar to the multi-armed bandit problem that would converge over time to the optimal ranking of the advertisements? I don't know the answer to that. And that's an interesting theoretical question there. Uh, there's a there is the connection to the literature on diversity. So in uh, the web search uh, research literature, uh, basically there are a lot of papers that start with this assumption that, uh, well, we want, to we want to define an ordering of the search results, for example. And we all know that diversity is good. So it's good to incorporate some element of diversity in the search results. And now the question is, how, how should we incorporate this, and so on and so forth. But uh, they all basically start with this assumption that it's good to have diversity. One nice feature of these models for externalities is that they don't start with this assumption, but they could result in diversity. Like for example, in the rational choice model, if you assume that you have different user types that care about, like one user type cares about Harry Potter the book, the other user type cares about Harry Potter the movie, and these user types actually have different preferences. Now here, in order to maximize your click-through rate without explicitly incorporating any element of diversity, you do have to have a diverse search result. Okay? So that's an interesting way to look at the diversity problem, both for the web search result and also for advertising. Uh, basically, looking at the diversity as a way to increase the click-through rate. Uh, and I haven't seen anything done based on this um, approach. Another interesting direction is to look at the long-term externalities. Here I was looking at the, basically the short-term externality. If I'm showing this ad next to another ad, how is it going to affect the click-through rate of the second ad? Okay? But there is another effect here. That's the long-term uh, externality. If you keep showing good ads to the users, the users will become much more likely to click on your ad. Okay? And that's actually that's another factor that's uh, distinguishing Google from uh, Yahoo and Amazon. I mean, that's one, one of the hypotheses why they have a higher revenue per search than Microsoft or Yahoo. Because they have been better at uh, showing ads that are more relevant. And as a result, the average click-through rate of the users are higher on Google compared to Microsoft versus, you know, and Yahoo, for example. And, uh, and traditionally, for traditional forms of advertising, these things have been looked at. The difference between traditional advertising and online advertising is that uh, in traditional advertising, there are, there's not much that could be measured, basically. Okay? So, but in online advertising, everything is locked. So you can measure basically everything, and you can try to learn things based on this and optimize your allocation based on this. For traditional advertising, the, in the economic literature, literature uh, what has been looked at is basically this uh, truth in advertising regulations. Uh, sometimes advertisers can benefit by forcing the government to uh, 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 essentially establish regulations that does not let the advertisers uh, lie in their advertisements, just because even though it's limiting themselves, but in the long run it can benefit them because that would increase the trust. So that's, there is a similar question in online advertising, and it would be interesting to actually theoretically look at this. Finally, there is the example of online dating, which is another uh, a very interesting special case of the lead generation business. It's actually one of the fastest growing segments of the lead generation industry. Because if you think of it, this is really a lead generation business. And uh, it hasn't really been linked that this way. I mean, most of the online dating businesses so far are based on fixed fee uh, subscriptions. But uh, this, is really, this is really a matter that uh, people care about. And I've actually talked to people that are, you know, have startups that are doing online dating. And this is a real question for them. Like, uh, if somebody is searching uh, for a uh, possible partner, what set of search results should they show them? Should they show them the most quote unquote desirable uh, uh, people, or should they try to diversify this in order to like, basically take into account these externalities that these people are imposing on each other? Obviously, yeah, there are all those problems as well. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so this issue of externalities in the context of lead generation for online dating is an interesting uh, uh, research problem that has not been looked at. 
לצאת.